Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a man who plays an absolutely key role in fostering international interest in the German language and culture. And here he is, Johannes Ebert. Hello, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us here on Talking no, Germany today. You. Great stuff. Now, Johannes Ebert is the Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, which has for over six decades now been promoting cultural exchange. He's a man who is constantly on the go and has, above all, closely monitored the momentous changes that have been taking place as part of the Arab Spring. And I'd like to begin, though, by asking Johannes Ebert to tell us a little bit more about the Goethe Institute and the work that it does. Yeah, the Goethe Institute, as you said, is the German organization for fostering German language, culture, and inform about Germany. We are present in about uh, 80 countries with 139 institutes and 13 institutes in Germany who teach German. Mm -hmm. So our work is to give German language courses, do training of German teachers, uh, develop curricula together with our guest countries on German, do cultural exchange programs in any kind, in music, uh, literature, art, uh, together with our partners in the countries. And we have libraries and, uh, of course, websites and, and di digital programs who inf which inform about Germany. So this is an, uh, it's a, a huge operation. It's a yeah, huge it's a operation. operation yeah. And this is a very fast uh, look on our... Okay, uh, so that's the overview. Yes. Yeah? And yeah. it's all about the German language and the German culture. Let's get straight to the controversy, because this, all ha this is all <laughs> happening at a time when the, of the global financial crisis. Yes. In a lot of countries, there's austerity and recession. And Germany, certainly in the European context, but not really only there, is really central to all that. Yeah? So I'd like to ask you, how popular is Germany at this point in time? I think there are two sides. I mean, you, you, you follow the newspapers... As soon as our Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel travels somewhere, of course there are some negative reactions, which I don't understand, but there are some negative reactions. Because people think in Europe that Germany is getting too much control, is, 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 is the cause for the austerity programs and so on. On the other hand, there's I a... Mean, let's be honest, Germany is viewed as cold and unforgiving in the European context. Yeah, this is the, it is know, not, this is the backdrop uh, yeah, to the work you're doing. Yeah? But on the other hand, Germany is also seen as a kind of a model. The, the, the economy still works very well. The, there's, a, there's a keen interest in international relations, in exchange. There's also help for other countries. So I think both sides of Germany are seen uh, in this situation, in this difficult economic situations all over the world. I think both sides of, of Germany are... Or, or, or Germany is seen from two sides, mm. which are... Some are negative, some are positive. Mm. I think uh, there's a quite a good and positive outlook, outlook on Germany in many respects. Okay, yeah. absolutely. And there are two perspectives we will have to deal with in the course of this show. I'd just like to ask you, as regards the language, does, does Germany have any chance whatsoever in the competition? There's a very real competition between languages these days with the, with the, the global languages like English and Spanish and Mandarin. I think it's uh, not a question of... I, I would not use the term competition. I think English is the world language, language number one. But I think uh, German is one of the big languages still. And as we see from the developments of the figures in our courses, and also in, in, the, in the countries in which we operate, it's on the rise in many, many cases. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic about the future of German, and I'm optimistic about the fact that people regard foreign languages as, a, as an important part of their education. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important. I think people recognize that, of course, with English they can communicate everywhere, but they need a, another element which puts them into the situation to, to, to compete on the working market better and, and, and to study more easier, to open more windows mm -hmm. for themselves. And I think uh, uh, languages and German languages play, language plays a very crucial role in this opinion. Some very interesting points. Uh, first impressions there from Johannes Ebert. Here is more. In May 2011, Johannes Ebert took over as Secretary General of the Goethe Institute. At the Munich headquarters, he and his staff oversee 149 institutes and 10 liaison offices in 92 countries. A normal working day for him begins at 8 and can last 11 hours or more. The Secretary-General is the Goethe Institute's top culture manager. 
The job consists mainly of phone calls, meetings and conferences. But that's only when the boss is actually in. About half the time he's out and about, often on trips abroad, helping to get new projects started, such as the Urban Mela in Mumbai, India, or in Johannesburg, South Africa. In addition to its broad-based efforts to promote the German language, the Goethe Institute also takes part in cultural exchanges with other countries and presents a contemporary image of Germany under the Secretary-General's direction. The Goethe Institute documents its many projects at its Munich library. We have translation programs for children in various countries. One example from the Arab world is Alema Krisasad, the world of stories. Johannes Ebert was born in Ulm in 1963. After graduating from high school in 1982, he studied political science and Islamic studies in Freiburg and Damascus. He went on to do practical training with a newspaper and soon came to the Goethe Institute. Starting in 1991, he served in various positions, among them Institute Director in Kiev and Regional Director in Cairo and Moscow. A debriefing after an international conference of German teachers at the Munich headquarters. The objective always remains the promotion of the German language around the world. Our guest today on Talking Germany, Johannes Ebert. And Johannes Ebert and I were just chuckling about some of those uh, photos from your youth, from your young days. You grew up in small town southern Germany yes. in the 60s and 70s. What, what memories do you have from that time? It's a small town of 10,000 inhabitants, and I had a, a very nice childhood. <laughs> I mean, it looks str sounds strange, but... It, it doesn't sound <laughs> no, nice, no, 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 exactly as nice you say. Yeah. My, my yeah. parents had a shop mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the city, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a brother and a sister, and I went to, 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 to Grundschule, to mm -hmm. the basic to the primary school. school, primary yeah. school. Yeah. Then I went to another city to, for gymnasium, for, mm -hmm. uh, for the grammar school. And I, have, I played football, I played volleyball, I had a lot of friends. We were, yeah, I, I was a normal German youth. You were a normal German youth in the, in, in the 60s it's and 70s, 70s, the time yeah. of the Wirtschaftswunde, the economic miracle in Germany. The reason I'm asking you about, your, about those days as a youngster is because I think it's, it's true to say that Germany has changed yeah. hugely since then. Yeah. Just describe yeah. those changes for Yeah, us. but I, I remark these changes, especially when I came back now after 15 years abroad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, when, we were, when, we were, when we left Germany 15 years ago with my wife uh, and we came back with the children, uh, it was very interesting to see how mixed this, the society is now. In the last 15 years, there has been a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when you go to school, there are a lot of children who have migration background, Turkish or African. And it was very, a very good situation now in this respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, my, from my small village, I mean, I wanted to get out at a certain point. Yeah, when uh -huh. I was 19. <laughs> so and on one hand, it was my, it, it's still my base. Yeah, my, my mother is still living there. My brother and my sisters are still living there with their family. So we see each other re quite regularly, Christmas, and, but also on birthdays. And so on. It's, it's still an important place for me. Uh, but at a certain time, this is a very n narrow space. Yeah. And, you, and you talked about getting out. And, get, and that's precisely what you did, because you took an, a very unusual step of going abroad to study, and not just anywhere. Tell us about that. Yeah, I studied first, I studied in Freiburg, in mm -hmm. Germany, but then I got a scholarship from the DRD mm -hmm. to go one year to Syria, mm -hmm. because I studied Islamic studies, I studied Arabic and, uh, and, and history. So the German and, Foreign Exchange Programme, you got a scholarship yeah, from I there. got a scholarship, yeah. and I studied one year in Syria. It was mostly German, uh, Arabic language, mm -hmm. uh, studies of Arabic language, but also we heard some, some lessons in university and so on. And of course, I was traveling a lot at that time. Yeah, I was, I mean, 23 and... I, I, practically, I went everywhere, and and when I see in TV what's going on in Syria now, it's it's it's, it's it touching me. It breaks yeah, your heart. It, I would yeah, guess. it's touching yeah. me emotionally because I know these places. I know Aleppo and so on. So, uh, but it, for me personally, it was a very important time. Well, let's just go back then. Let's go back to what Damascus was like back then. What were your impressions back then? I mean, um, Damascus, the the whole region 
is always in the last, in the time in, in which I was there and which I was busy with it, uh, like in my studies and so on, it was always a region of instabili instability. Mm -hmm. I mean, also at that time when I was there in 84, uh, there was a war going on between the Palestinians and Israelis and so on. Be uh, Lebanon was closed and so on. So it, it was also at that time a, a, a place of instability. But for me personally, I had so many friends. I had, I had so many impulses for my life from this wonderful city. This, it's, architecturally, it's wonderful. You have the Umayyad Mosque, you have the old city. So, uh, and at a, when you are 24, you're very open for everything. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a really good experience and important experience for, in my life. And what's the current situation for the Goethe Institute now in Syria at this time of civil it's war? It's closed. You, you've closed down yes, your we offices closed, in We closed Damascus the beginning of this year. We also already reduced our work uh, in the middle of last year. But in the beginning of this year, for security reasons, we stopped to operate. Mm. Um, and we hope to reopen when it's getting better. We, we did not close it like forever. But we, we are still hoping that things are getting better because I think there's a, 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 a role for the cultural institutes to play. Yeah? Mm. So I hope and, things are getting better. And another Arab city that you know particularly well is Cairo, exactly. another city that's very close to your heart. Tell us yeah. about how you view the uh, developments in Cairo and around the Arab Spring in the last yeah, two years. Yeah. Where, where are we now yeah. currently? I was, as, as you mentioned, I was in Cairo from 2002 to 2007, so I saw the Arab Spring movements only from TV, mm -hmm. but it also touched me because I have still friends there, which I phoned immediately and so on. Actually, I was in Cairo four weeks ago and talked to many people from the cultural field, and um, I had an interview with the writer Ala uh, al-Asmani, who is a, one of the most famous writer in, in, writers in, in, in Egypt right now, worldwide known. And he, I think, for the cultural people, the situation is a, a situation of transmission. It's not clear what comes. Uh, we have the difficult situation, the parliament was suspended, we, we have a, a government and, uh, and I think it's not clear in which direction it exactly goes. And, uh, and the democratic transformation is just taking place right now. So there are people who see things quite negative, that, that the development gets narrower again, I would say, and there are other ones who say, okay, we have this situation, we have a democracy now, and now all the democratic forces have to, have to, to develop, and then uh, in the end there will be a positive result. But the enthusiasm, the big enthusiasm which we saw during the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. I think it calmed down a little bit. I think uh, now the realistic situation seems more difficult to mm. everybody. And uh, I hope also that everything is going well in this democratic transformation process. Cautious optimism is what you call yes. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We like to get our guests to bring along uh, a possession that is sort of close to their hearts. And this is what you brought along today, Johannes Ebert. Uh, this is a, it's a photo, which I think you should have a look at. And uh, Johannes will tell us a little bit about why this is uh, so yeah, it, important it, to him. It, it, it was difficult for me to find something. I, I, I asked myself, do I bring some family photos? Or so so I, I brought this photo, which is a little bit like uh, strange because it's a taxi in my office in, in Cairo. Yeah. I'm sitting there in the background. This is a remarkable it's, thing. It's a taxi it, in your yeah, office yes, in Cairo. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's an art project with German and Egyptian um, artists who were reflecting about the topic of public space and private space. And they decided to put a, a taxi in my office, uh, which, is, uh, which was an interesting experience for me. And actually there, there's a there's a red ribbon normally hanging there and the spectators come and look at me and the taxi in my office, <laughs> which is of course part, a very intelligent project because in Egypt, public space and hierarchies are very regulated. Uh -huh. So it has a certain critical touch in it mm -hmm. that you go to the office of the boss of the Goethe Institute just like that as a part of the art project is already sometimes somehow irritating and opening up things. So the, the artists knew what they, what they wanted. Yeah? So I, I had this, I had this uh, taxi one month in my office at a certain time, it began to lose oil. So oil was dropping. It, so was, dri it was dripping <laughs> yeah, on your office. Dripping, so we had, we had to put <laughs> something <laughs> under it. But 
So I, I, I think it was a, an interesting experience. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that along. OK, we're going to, we're going to talk now uh, in a little bit more detail about the activities of the Goethe Institute. Before we do so, however, uh, we have this report on a German-Kenyan music project sponsored by the Goethe Institute in Nairobi. Berlin meets Nairobi, Nairobi meets Berlin, and German techno beats meet Kenyan rap and hip-hop. This music workshop, held in 2011 by the Goethe Institute, brought two worlds together that had never had contact before. In many ways, Africa is somehow totally under the radar from the Western perspective, which is too bad, because what we've experienced here in Kenya, at least, has nothing whatever to do with the clichés we're familiar with. Joining the Teichmann brothers in Kenya are Mode Selector and Jacuzzi from Berlin. They worked with 14 musicians from Kenya. For the Africans, the techno beats from the capital of electronic music took some getting used to. It's less varied, yeah. Which is not to say that it's like it's 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 uh, it's 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 a and, and not a, an interesting environment to be in. It wasn't easy at first. We couldn't understand each other very well, but with time, we we, we you know gave each other a little bit more time, listened to the music a little bit more, and they understood what kind of beat they could make. They jammed and wrote new music in sessions in Nairobi and Berlin, recording a total of 18 new tunes. Most of them are out now as videos, among them Moto Millions by Uko Flani from Nairobi and Jacuzzi from Berlin. The difference from working in a studio in Berlin was huge. Maybe it has to do with the feeling for music or with Africa. I don't know. The aim of the project is for the musicians to learn from one another, expand their horizons and create something new together. rocking backwards and forwards. Uh, I, I like that report. It, it, there's something very interesting about it because I know that sort of after the, the fall of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, for the Goethe Institute, sort of Central and Eastern Europe was very much a strategic priority. Yeah. And when I watch that report, I wonder what, to what extent now Africa has become a new priority for you because there's huge dynamism in Africa these days. I mean, some uh, about Four or five years ago, there was an initiative of the government of Mr. Steinmeier, the Africa Initiative, and of course we are part of it. And now Africa actually is one of the strong places where the Goethe Institute works. Yeah, it's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we see that kind of project, we see German artists, German musicians in this case, representing Germany abroad. How important is that? How does it divide up, sort of German artists taking Germany abroad and the Goethe Institute providing a platform for local artists? I mean, I think it's both, and I think this is very important. As you say, as I said, one of our main tasks is to promote the cultural exchange between Germany and the guest countries. And the focus is on exchange. It's not a mere presentation, of yeah. course, this is also part if you exchange something, but it's exchange. That means both sides take part in it. And I think this Berlin Nairobi project uh, 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 illustrates this very well, yeah, because you have the Nairobi artists who have their club music, their rap music, and you have the, the German artists who go there. Actually, this pro project was very successful because they produced a, a, a CD which sold on the market and which was very popular also in international musical critics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think this example shows how the Goethe Institute works. It works in a dialo dialogic manner, mm -hmm. through dialogue. We, we, we develop projects together with our partners in the countries. Mm -hmm. And um, then, of course, the culmination of a good project is to do a good pro production together. Yeah. Because through a production, you learn much more about the other side, the other side, the other person, the artist, the art scene of the other world, mm -hmm. uh, than through a mere representation because you work together. Yeah. And I think the, the artists and the audience understand very much about German art, German uh, art scene and Germany through this exchange. Okay. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers are sitting at home listening to you talking about German culture and German culture and German culture, and they're saying they'd like me to ask you the question, you know, 
What is German culture? Define it for us. <laughs> a very, a very good question. <laughs> I mean, in former times we said Goethe, Schiller, and exactly uh, that's the problem. Is it? You've got Goethe, yeah. Schiller, <laughs> no, no, Beethoven, no. Ge- Wagner, <laughs> no. Thomas Mann. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, all yeah. heavy stuff. No, no, German culture is everything <laughs> plus. No, no, we have the Goethe Institute is standing or is promoting contemporary German culture, and it promotes and it and it promotes and it and it's um, and our approach is quite broad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We understand culture not only as the arts, as uh, literature and so on, but also discourse. What is going on in society? What do we discuss about in Germany? What do we discuss in the guest country? Uh, in the guest country, and the German culture today is, I think, international, very open, and in a way globalized with the German core. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with a German heart, a German accent. Yeah, yeah, with a uh, little bit stronger than an accent, but uh, I think it, it, it's part of a, a, a global art movement. And uh, I think this broad German culture is what we try to to bring into the exchange, mm-hmm. to project. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a political aspect to this as well, which is very interesting because Germany has got a very interesting political history. Obviously, it's got very dark chapters. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, there were two dictatorships yes. here in Germany, the Nazi tyranny and then the, uh, the communist rule in communist East Germany. Mm-hmm. But Germany has come through to develop a, what I think it's fair to say is a mature democracy, mm-hmm. despite all that. And that's a very interesting yeah. Yeah. message, a compelling message for many countries, I would guess. Yeah, I think it was a, a very important for the work you, you said uh, after the in, the... in the 90s, we started to work very strongly in Eastern Europe, because after the fall of the Soviet Union, it was possible to work there also. Yeah. And of course, there this was a very big topic that we, that Eastern Germany, that a part of the Germany had, was part of the socialist bloc and had this transformation process going on after the reunification. And the experiences that we took from this process was very important for the uh, for the work of the Goethe Institute, because uh, we, we could share experiences with former Eastern Bloc countries on the basis of a common ground, which is of course more convincing than if you talk theoretically about democracy. You say, okay, we had this, we faced this situation and that's how we tried to overcome it. I think this was a big topic uh, or still is a big topic for the work of the Goethe Institute. And it's a very, very big topic for a country that you have visited recently, which is uh, Myanmar, yeah. formerly known as Burma. Yeah. Tell us about that visit. Yeah, I was in Myanmar about uh, in, in October, uh, in September on a trip with our Minister of State and of the Foreign Ministry. And uh, the reason was that we, un- that we undersigned the Memorandum of Understanding, which makes, us po- makes it possible that we open a Goethe Institute there. It was very interesting for me to come there because it reminded me a little bit of the time when I came in the 90s, in the, uh, in the 90s to Riga, where I was working, to Latvia, and where, when the Soviet Union just had fallen down. Myanmar was closed for 40 years. It was a, a military regime, it still is. Um, and the country did not develop in a certain sense. It's surrounded by Thailand. It's surrounded by other booming mm. Eastern, East, uh, Eastern Asian countries. But it's, it's kind of stayed in a certain stuck in time. S- stagnation. Yeah, stuck in a time warp. Almost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this you could feel in, in certain things, in that, how, how the town center looks. And, 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 and the, 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 what we could see in the short trip, it was still in a, in a certain Dornröschenslav. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. know how you say it's it. It's the time warp that <laughs> yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and, but, but there, were, there is a will to reform. Mm-hmm. And there, there, you felt that? Yes, yes. We talked to many and people. And you believed it? I believed it. Of course, this is you, a question you have to ask yourself. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, but they already started certain things to open up, to let uh, international institutions Absolutely. inside, and mm-hmm. so on and so on. Mm-hmm. And we saw it uh, that many politicians now visited uh, Myanmar. And, uh, and, and so I think there's a certain openness. And this openness, of course, is a good ground for our work because we do not go there and say, this is the program we want to do, but we go there and meet the people from the cultural scene, from the education scene, and ask ourselves, what can we do together? Mm. And I think this is an important approach for this kind of country. And I hope 
that we can open there and find the resources to open an institute in Myanmar. 's as many people learning German at the Goethe Institute in Dresden as a year ago is that figure being reflected across the board yeah we have a not rise as much but we have a big rise especially in southwestern Europe mm -hmm. but also in other countries like uh, Russia or even in the United States the figures of in our courses are rising and all these new people who are they what, what, what? Uh, I think it's in generally said I think people conceive the knowledge of a second or third foreign language as a personal asset to their curriculum, work, study, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so on. So it's, it's the work. It's the work factor that is very that is really central at the moment. Yeah, I think surely. still we have some people who, who, who learn German because they are interested in the culture and, and, and so on. But I think right now the young people, it's more utilitaristic, like a more mm -hmm. instrumental approach. Yeah? They know why they're doing it. They know why they're doing it. Yeah. And maybe not... Uh, they say, I, maybe they do not say, I have this job in mind and I learn German and go there. But just as a general, a general plus for mm -hmm. their education mm -hmm. is German, German is right now seen as very uh, positive. Yeah. Mm. But there is a, I mean, it, it, yeah. l let's, you know, nail this down. There is well, a new, there, there is a huge new, uh, huge is too much, but, there, but there, there's a huge influx of, of people coming to Germany who are, you know, migrant workers. They're effectively new yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm, I, 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 <laughs> ah, maybe they, uh, we, we, you're not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we see a, we see a trend in, for example, in southern southeastern Europe, uh, southwestern Europe, mm -hmm. where our courses in Spain and Portugal really nearly doubled the size. Mm -hmm. uh, and these oh, these it's true what you say. It's young people, young engineers, young uh, nurses, young doctors who want to find or already found mm -hmm. work in Germany. Mm -hmm. And they get the courses in our institutes in, uh, in, in the countries, but they also can continue their studies in German in our institutes in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, also with, a, with a, some of them also with, a, with an employment already ahead. For example, uh, some weeks ago I was in Lisbon and we have a course there for nurses who will then uh, work in a, in a Frankfurt hospital mm -hmm. and who do the language uh, training in the Goethe Institute, which is of course very important that a nurse speaks very well German when you get uh, have to communicate with patients in Germany. So I think German in all these attempts of young people of Southwestern Europe or other parts of Europe to come to Germany to work here and German employers who are looking for this workforce, I think the missing link between them is the German language. And of course the Goethe Institute has the professional means to help in this case. Mm. One wonders what kind of a welcome those people are going to get when they come to Germany, because you've been very upbeat so far about, about how Germany has developed in the last 15, yeah. 20 years, yeah. how it's become much more of an, of an open country. <coughs> I think that's absolutely true. However, uh, it's not too long ago, October 2010, I think, was that it was the date that the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, she said the following. <coughs> she said, efforts to build a multicultural society in Germany have failed. Failed utterly. Yeah, that was, a, that was a remark that a lot of people outside Germany, they listened very closely to because they thought if the Chancellor says it's failed, it has failed. I'm not sure. I think when we talk about this welcoming foreign, um, foreigners, I think Germany developed very much uh, compared to the time when I was living in Germany 15 years ago. I think there's a, a development. I see it when I came here. I saw it when I came here. And, uh, but I think we still can work on this welcome culture. Mm -hmm. I think there are still things to improve. But we also have to say that things already improved. And there's a second point. I mean, uh, when we talk about these... Uh, people who want to work here and then maybe go back to their countries and so on. It's also a question of mobility. And we don't have to forget that the European Union is based on the thought of mobility, mm. on the thought that everybody within the European can travel and work freely. This is a very important point. Yeah. For me, it's a very important point because now, through, also through the crisis, this mobility really takes place. And maybe it's a chance for us.
Mm. Maybe it's a chance if a Portuguese young 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 person comes to a city in Germany, works there for two three years, goes back, works there. So there's 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 a new link mm. between the countries, which maybe will open up the European borders much more. I still must. I'm optimist. <laughs> you're, you're an optimist, but I mean, I still must press the point because the, the, we, we've been telling a sort of a happy story here so far. But I mean, you know. I read that 9% of Germans have a sort of a, a relatively far-right mindset. I read that anti-Semitism is on the rise. Mm -hmm. People here in Germany are trying to come to terms with the recent revelations that there was a whole series of racially motivated murders carried out by a terrorist cell. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, how, what do you do at the Goethe Institute about that, about that side of the story? I mean, I think we inform about Germany quite openly. Mm -hmm. We do not... We do not put into focus a merely positive picture of Germany. We try to inform about Germany as a whole, also with these uh, black sides, I yeah. would say. But I think these black sides are present in every country in a way. So, and, and of course we cannot do more than say, okay, you are welcome, the foreigners, and with these crimes, I mean, this is a question for police and for, for the criminal uh, institutions which have to carry about it. But I think in general, I would say that Germany is a quiet, is an open country for foreigners now. I, I, I mean, you're a foreigner. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, I better I ask you yeah. what you think We about. have to tell the full story, but I'm with you all the way there. There, there's no denying it that it's not it's not very long ago in Germany because I can remember it quite well we're, we're only talking about the last couple of decades tops that if somebody if a young person had said I can speak Turkish or Polish and not just German that was a stigma and that has changed now it's uh, it's a bonus I agree I don't I don't know how the situation was before but I see it from my own children. I mean my wife is American but she has a Laotian background. She come she came from Laos as a child mm -hmm. and my children now for the first time live in Germany in their life. We have been 15 years abroad. Yeah. And at home we speak English and German. Mm -hmm. My wife speaks English, me I speak uh, German with the kids. Mm -hmm. And we were a little bit hesitating how the situation would be in Germany because my children look Asian, partly, Asian, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, and we ask ourselves, how would the, the 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 situation in Germany be? Maybe based on this on the what you said that before it was a little bit strange for yeah. Germans this yeah. multicultural thing, and we were very happy when we came here to basic school, elementary school. Mm -hmm. uh, there were so many mixed children, like from different uh, from countries, from Turkey, from uh, Africa, our children with an Asian background. It was completely normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a very good experience. I mean, there's a certain openness which we enjoy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how many, how many languages do you speak yourself? I, I learned English uh, and Latin. Latin, I forgot, but I don't speak it. <laughs> and uh, English and French. And then I studied Arabic. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Turkish, but I forgot nearly everything, and and Russian when I was in Kiev and in Moscow. Ah, so. Kiev. Just tell me about Kiev, because that was one of your favourite postings, I yeah, know. Yeah, it's a wonderful city. Yeah. So who has never been in Kiev should go to Kiev. <laughs> no, it's a wonderful city. And it was uh, interesting from two points of view. It was uh, in, in the 90s when there was very big openness, very big interest in getting to know more about Germany, about the German language and so on. But it's also a wonderful city. You have the Dnepr, you have the green hills going up the Dnepr, you have a nice old buildings. It's it's a, a, a secret secret, uh, secret recommendation yeah. secret <laughs> tip yeah. that I think I should uh, that I think I should act on. Yeah. yeah. You have been described as a pragmatic visionary. Ah. <laughs> which is the pragmatic bit and which is the visionary? I mean, the visionary is that I, that we always have to to ask ourselves what, how will the good things would be in the next ten years? Yeah, what what trends do we have to face? How do we have to develop? Of course, we have to develop visions together with my colleagues. And the pragmatic thing is that 
I don't know. I'm just trying to make things happen. <laughs> so this is the pragmatic thing. Yeah. So. It's interesting. I was looking at one of those, when I was researching the show, I was looking at one of those websites the other day where they were talking about sort of what are the typical characteristics of Germans as seen by people from abroad. And one of the characteristics was they're good at planning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You have to do some planning for the future for I the good things, right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, time for our traditional talking Germany quiz. Yeah, towards the end of the show, um, is German culture more Goethe and Schiller or techno and Bundesliga? Both. <laughs> Every, all four of them. All, all four. four of them. <laughs> <laughs> when foreigners tell you they're very interested in Germany, what are the three things they mention first? Uh, you mentioned some of them. I think it's cars. Cars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's f football. <laughs> football? No, and maybe not the football. Maybe this nice landscapes and, yeah, maybe nice landscapes, nice surroundings mm -hmm. and culture, of course. Okay. <laughs> and football. <laughs> football number four. Yeah. Uh, your favorite Goethe Institute posting, Cairo, Kiev or somewhere else completely different? I don't say this. I was happy in all these places. Ah, the ah, diplomat, no, no, the diplomat, diplomat in this train here, yeah? No, no, there are good, good things everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Is Germany multicultural or monocultural? Multicultural. Is Germany an ordinary everyday country or a cultural leader? Cultural leader. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, that's your lot with Johannes Ebert, the Secretary General of Germany's Goethe Institute. If you want to find out more, do read my blog on the Talking Germany website. And if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>